just a minute, just a minute. Um, respected uh, speaker, a resource person of uh, today's uh, JRF class, Dr. Emmanuel Chongpoi Hokip, scientist, soil science, ICAR Indian Institute of Soil Science, Bhopal. And uh, she is more specialized in soil science. And uh, we welcome you. And also, we thank you for accepting our invitation and to speak and train our uh, students for JRF um, aspirant students. And uh, it will be a great uh, privilege to have you as a resource person, as a speaker, uh, to train in that area soil science. What are the possible um, things to study and questions from the soil science? And uh, thank you for accepting our invitation. And it is being conducted in IDP Nahe project. Uh, our Dean Sir, uh, Dr. Bian Azarika, Nodal Officer, and I'm an Associate Nodal Officer of this uh, project. Our PA of the project is uh, respected Dr. Uh, Basanda Singh Sir, Director of Instruction. He's uh, coordinating overall this uh, program. I would like to thank our uh, DA Sir for giving this opportunity to conduct this uh, JRF coaching class through online. And, and dear students, and uh, make use of uh, this um, platform to interact with uh, Madam Emmanuel so that you can learn a lot of things from her. And also uh, she will be uh, focusing some of the topic and uh, at the end we'll have a question and answer session. In between, if you have any doubts, you can just type it on the chat box and your questions and queries will be answered at the end. Or in between also, if you want to interact, you can interact with the Madam Emmanuel. And uh, thank you so much for joining. And some of you are in YouTube, you are watching. And if you have any queries also, please let us know. And thank you so much. And now you can take your time. I'll hand over the time to you. Yeah, please carry on. Thank you, thank you sir. Uh, thank you, Dr. Basanta sir, uh, Hazarika sir, and Raza sir for giving me this opportunity. And of course, Nansol, uh, she's my friend, and she's been contacting me for the past uh, month. And yeah, today uh, I'll be talking about a little bit about soil science because not, uh, it's not possible to cover everything in a matter of two hours. So what I feel important and what I have experienced for the past uh, maybe a few years from my GRA preparation and other things that I will be sharing to the students. So yeah, I'm Emmanuel. I am a scientist in, from, uh, in soil science from Indian Institute of Soil Science. So today, um, just an overview of what I will be talking about, like some important books for soil science as well as for other agricult general agriculture, then pattern of examination, then uh, some other tips and some little bit about soil science. If, as I've said, it's not important possible to cover everything and you can always interrupt me in the middle if you have any doubts or uh, if you want to and I have given my mail and my contact number this have a whatsapp so you can always write to me regarding soil science uh, any particular topic that you want I can prepare uh, if you have a specific needs if you have any specific topic that you have you have any doubt or if you want to know more about it even uh, for a short while uh, we can discuss through zoom or through whatsapp chat so it's all um, we are all i'm always open to help you so uh, yeah these are some of uh, the books for soil science and i have given some books in red color at the bottom eight nine and ten then you have objective agriculture this is a very important book for each of you Others are soil science specifics, so I hope by now every soil students preparing for soil science would have known by now that these are important. But 8, 9 and 10 are important for everyone because uh, if when you see your syllabus, you will be seeing some portion of general agriculture. So it's not possible to go and study back every agriculture subjects as such. So uh, number 8 and number 10 will give you uh, an outline of what you need to study. So you will have some objective, some sort of notes on a particular subject. So what I would like you to do is to cover everything in these objective books. So suppose if you are preparing for uh, horticulture, 
you need to know some things about uh, maybe agronomy, soil science, or maybe some plant pathology. So you go and look in objective agriculture and you study whatever is given there. there. And statistics is also another important subject, uh, which we find it very difficult. So even all those statistics questions, which are in number eight, so you just uh, study, you practice with uh, the objective questions. So let's hope that uh, they will ask something from there. So when they ask from, for general agriculture, it won't be so tough. So you uh, prepare in such a way that uh, you be able to answer it. And then you have another general agriculture. So uh, when I was analyzing some of the questions from 2019-20, uh, I'm focusing on 2019 and 2020 because uh, the exam was conducted by NTA, National Testing Agency, and not by ICR. So the system become a little bit different. So you have to also uh, change according to that. So, and there, uh, what they asked was institute like ICR institutes or international organizational institutes like CIMIT, IRI, where they are located. And so uh, their headquarters and then some government schemes are there um, like, uh, uh, so this government have come up with many schemes. So you study all those schemes and then like uh, some day specific day, observance day, suppose ozone day, world water day, and then production of different agriculture commodities, who are the highest producer in the country, and how much is the production. Uh, so those are some of the things that uh, I, I want you to see for general agriculture. And you have, must have heard so many by this week, because I think you have heard uh, so many lectures already on these aspects. Then the pattern of examination is online, computer-based, uh, so conducted by National Testing Agency. I have seen that there are 120 questions for two hours, so you will get an average of one minute for each questions. So you will have uh, met the following questions, uh, which was around four or five. And then some previous questions are available in these uh, websites, IRI Topos and Agri Exam. You can, you can obtain from there. And then some notes also uh, is uh, freely available from ICR websites. He agreed this is from TNAU, so you can easily uh, take from this uh, these websites. And then some tips from my experience is that you know your syllabus. You always see your syllabus, what you are going to study, what is there included, so you know your syllabus. And study a particular subject and then work on the objective. Suppose uh, I'm from soil science, so if I study uh, something related to nitrogen, nitrogen in soil. So I will go and study that particular subject and then I will go to objective books and do all the objective related on that uh, particular uh, chapter that is nitrogen. So whatever related to nitrogen is there in the nitrogen objective book. So I will work on that. And then another is seek help and advice from your seniors who have done well in GRF. So most of the time we are um, a little bit reluctant to seek advice from and help from others. Uh, so we should not be hesitant, uh, call them, ask for advice. Uh, if they are busy and if they ask you to call you back, call again and you, you, you should get advice from them. Doesn't mean that uh, whatever they said is going to be asked in the exam, but it will uh, help you in your confidence. You can even ask them like uh, practice questions, uh, ask me some questions in a day, then I will try to answer. If you don't, if you're unable to answer, you ask uh, the answers from them. And then have a good discussion between alike subjects. Suppose uh, in CHF, many, most of them used to prepare for horticulture. So you have a group discussion, uh, which is not possible at the moment because I know that most of you are out of the hostel, but then you can still discuss. You can just, somebody can just ask a question because we have lots of variety which are coming up. What my friends usually do is uh, during uh, lunch or dinner time, they will discuss what are the varieties of uh, orange, what are the varieties which are there. So you can do it like that. You can gain from one another. You have, uh, why I... The reason I said this is that you are not competing among you. You are competing all India level, and you have to set up yourself as a group, and you have to uh, improve one another. And in the group, some will be a little bit uh, brighter, some might not be so, but uh, you just try to build up one another. And then during the exam, 
don't uh, freak out. Uh, you see, you open the computer, and then the first thing you saw was not. If you don't know the answer, you, you should not freak out. Uh, you should be cool, calm, level-headed, and you try to know. And then attempt first the answer which you know, which we you are supposed you have 120 questions. Then attempt which you are 100% sure uh, where you will will not be wrong. You will you are 100% sure. Attempt first all those, and then uh, then you. Keep on how many questions because uh, in the computer base you will be knowing how much you have already answered, how much is still left. So you will know how much you have already answered, and then again go to the questions which you have 50-50 chance like of knowing it. You are not very sure, but you are 50% sure that that is the right answer. So go and do maybe a maximum of 10 to 15 of those questions. And then mm, do not attempt the questions for which you don't have any idea about the answers. Many times we do inky donkey ponky trying to get answers because it is objective. You may be sure if if what if this is right. So uh, my experience is that don't do it because you have negative person and negative mm, marking of I think 25 percent, 25 percent or two to three percent. I'm not very sure. So uh, if you don't know the answer, do not attempt it. And if you don't do well in the exam, do not fret. This is not the end of the world. You have uh, your future ahead of you and try to, and then not only GRF, you prepare for BHU, you prepare for other exams also that will, if you are really wanting to do your masters in the in subjects. So this is a few tips from my side, from my experience. So again, attempt first with your 100% sure and then limit your, to limit your chances to 10, 15 questions when you know 50% of the answer. So, so that your negative, mark, negative marks will not be so high. Most, from my experience was that uh, most of the time we keep on choosing, we keep on answering, and then at the end of the, when the result comes, then the negative was so high that our scores are usually low. So uh, this is some of, these are some of the tips that I can give you from my own experience. Then the well, soil is so important. So this is um, the sum. Then it provides uh, physical support, and it encores the root. Uh, then root respiration, allowing carbon dioxide from the root to escape and oxygen to enter into the root zone. And then it also holds water for absorption, moderates the soil temperature fluctuations and it acts as a storehouse of nutrients. So plant takes most of its nutrients from the soil. And it's also a habitat of micro and macro organisms. Measure, uh, these are the measured soils of India. There are about uh, seven. Uh, why I give you this was uh, because questions are asked for general agriculture from this table. So you have a soil and they will ask you from which, where they are found. So when I was preparing for GRF, my friend said that red soil, where was red soil found in India? So they'll give all these options and then they have to answer. So likewise, you have alluvial soil. Alluvial means they are made from river. So where river is there? You have a Ganga, you have a Brahmaputra. So wherever this uh, Yamuna is there, wherever these rivers are there, then you will get this type of soils. And then black cotton soils, they are found in Maharashtra, Madhya Pradesh, then some other states, Gujarat, Rajasthan, Chhattisgarh. Red soils, the red soils are found in Northeast. You will see all the mountains red when you travel. So Andhra, if you have traveled to Andhra, Tamil Nadu, Karnataka, the whole soil is so red, you can find it. And then laterite, lateritic soils, Desert soils are found simple in the desert. There are two types of desert, hot desert, cold desert, hot arid in the Western part. And then you have cold arid in La Ledak region of Jammu and Kashmir. And and you have salt, uh, salt forest and hill soils are simple. They are found in forest region. Just hold on a minute, sir. I 
And then you have uh, salt affected soil. I have discussed in some other uh, chapters, so I won't be discussing here. And then you have peat and marcy soil. This can be asked because these are very particular type of uh, soils. Uh, you have in West Bengal, Sundarban area, if you have uh, visited, then there'll be this peat and marcy soil. And then you have uh, mangrove vegetation in the, those areas. These are in Orissa, Tamil Nadu, and Goa. So um, I feel that it's important to study nutrients because these have been all asked as the general questions. So essential nutrients, why are they essential? Why are they called essential? Because they are directly involved in a particular function in the nutrition of plants. And then the deficiency will make it impossible to complete its life, its life cycle. So before maturity, if that particular nutrient is deficient, they will not complete its cycle, they will die or they will not reproduce. And deficiency is specific to the lemon uh, and can be only prevented by or corrected by supplying the element. So if you have nitrogen deficiency, you cannot correct it with potassium. You have to supply nitrogen. In case of nitrogen deficiency, you have to supply potassium in case of potassium deficiency. So there are 17 essential nutrients and nickel is the latest element that is added in 1987. So this is important. And then uh, there are many classification of essential nutrients, but I have yeah, the which is uh, very simple one. Then you have a uh, carbon dioxide and water, carbon dioxide in the air and water from the soil or maybe from rainfall. So this constitute uh, ninety six percent. This constitute ninety six percent, and then you have the macronutrients. And you have macronutrients, which is, uh, uh, they're required in large quantity. And micronutrients, they are required in smaller quantity. And you, you know which are the micronutrients, which are the macronutrients. And in micronutrients, macronutrients, you have primary and secondary nutrients. They are called primary because uh, they are required in larger quantity and they're secondary because they are required in smaller quantity. These primary nutrients are supplied mainly through commercial fertilizers and secondary nutrients are supplied along with primary nutrients. So when you are supplying uh, phosphorus, you used to use SSP, single superphosphate. So single superphosphate contains calcium and this calcium uh, is a secondary nutrient because it is supplied through phosphorus, uh, including phosphorus. Of course, you can supply with an other uh, second, uh, specific secondary nutrients also. Mm, so, And then you have another, which is mobile nutrient as well as uh, N in mobile nutrients. Mobile nutrients are mainly negative in, uh, in their charge. And these are the form in which uh, nutrients are available. So we have nitrate. When it is nitrogen can be both mobile and immobile. They are mobile when in the, in the form of nitrate and they are immobile when in the form of uh, ammonium ion. But uh, one uh, thing you have to know is that phosphorus, phosphate, which is negative in charges, but that is considered immobile. So this is one of the um, thing that you have to keep in mind when you are considering mobile and immobile nutrients in soil. Then, yeah, there are classification of different uh, nutrient range in the tissue. It, when was it deficient? Deficient when essential elements is very low or uh, very low in content that it limits the yield. And you can see visible symptoms, the, uh, distinct visible symptoms. And critical nutrient range is the nutrient concentration below which yield respond to added nutrients occur. So uh, there is a particular range below which when you supply nutrients, it will increase the yield. But if it doesn't increase the yield, that means that it's not in the critical range. And nutrient is sufficient when the nutrient concentration range, when the added nutrient do not increase the yield. Excessive or toxic, when the nutrient concentration is too high, that it will limit the plant growth and it will reduce the yield. What is Stinberg effect? Under severe deficiency, a rapid increase in yield with added nutrient can cause a small decrease in nutrient concentration. So the yield in the growth increase so rapidly that the nutrient concentration is reduced. And then there is also another, which I have not included here, hidden hunger. 
what is hidden hunger? Hidden hunger is when the nutrient is deficient, but you do not see any visible symptoms. So you will think that the nutrient is sufficient, but inside the plant, the nutrient is deficient and there will be limitations in plant growth. So these are the forms in which uh, nitrogen, in which min, my, uh, min, nutrients are absorbed and the, they are the major functions are there. So I want you to learn the, this absorbed form and the major functions. These slides will be available to you. Uh, so we don't have to worry about it. Nitrogen, phosphorus, and they are part of the nucleic acid and they are important. This phosphorus is important for ATP, which is the energy storehouse of uh, any organism. And then potassium mainly involved in enzyme activation, water balance because it is a ion, and then stomatal opening. And then sulfur, sulfur is uh, part of uh, some amino acids and through amino acids, uh, they form proteins and they are also part of coenzyme. Then calcium that affects the cytoskeleton, the membrane, many enzymes and secondary messenger. Then magnesium. It is a part of chlorophyll, which I will tell you later. Uh, magnesium is important in biological nitrogen fixation. So when there is a conversion of uh, atmospheric nitrogen to ammonia, magnesium is one of the most important um, nutrient required by the plants. And then you have um, micronutrients. Micronutrients are mainly uh, in, required for enzymes. They are electron carriers, and then chlorine. Chlorine deficiency of chlorine is not much seen in the atmosphere, but some in some plants it have been reported. Otherwise, uh, though it is essential, it's not largely deficient in plants. Then we have manganese activation of many enzymes, and then among all this, nickel. Nickel is very important for urea. It's a component of urea's enzyme, which is used for. Uh, microbial degradation of urea fertilizers. And then you have molybdenum. Molybdenum is used for nitro, nitrate reduction. So these are the, some major functions. There are so many other functions, but uh, these are major functions. Then deficiency symptoms. Deficiency symptoms. Uh, so uh, in the previous year, I have seen questions in the maths the following that deficiency symptoms Nutrients are given and deficiency symptoms are given. There are some very uh, particular name given in deficiency symptoms, uh, like names. You learn it uh, because it can be asked for any other subjects also. So nitrogen, it is mainly yellowing or chlorosis of the leaves. Then. It, it started all, mainly from the order leaves. And phosphorus, one of the most significant deficiency symptoms is purple discoloration of leaves, especially in maize. When you see maize field, if there is any phosphorus deficiency, you will see purple color. So this is due to antonin, anthocyanin accumulation. And potassium, uh, chlorosis and necrosis at the edges of the leaf will give light as if it is a burn. Then calcium, calcium blossom and rot in tomato and bitter pit of apple. These are very important uh, symptoms, deficiency symptoms. And magnesium intervenor chlorosis. And then sulfur. Sulfur is common in cruciferous crops such as cabbage and rapeseed because they require maximum quantity of sulfur in plants. And then we have boron, internal cork of apple, hard rot of sugar beet, marigold. And we have browning or hollow stem and then cauliflower. So the cauliflower, there will be, if you see the stem, there will be browning or there will be hollow color. So you all are from horticulture uh, college, so you must have seen that uh, this type of uh, symptoms. Then in topical, there will be top sickness, well, the top buds will be rotted. Then iron, there is intervenal chlorosis on the young leaves and bronching. So if, I have shown to you mobile and immobile nutrients. So if it is mobile, the deficiency symptoms will be visible in the older leaves. If it is immobile, the deficiency symptoms will be visible in the younger leaves. So iron is immobile. So it will be 
so intravenous chlorosis is in the younger leaf and bronching. This is a very important uh, in rice. This is due to iron toxicity and especially found in poorly drained soils or submerged soil. So our the rice which we grow in India is mostly puddle rice soil. So if there is a high iron content, there will be some kind of iron toxicity. And then manganese, gray speck of your oats, mars spot of peas, there will be black black spots in the in pea. And then speckle yellow of sugar beet. Copper, the deficiency is high in soils which have high organic content. And then such as in pea and muck soils. And jing, white butt in corn, white butt in maize, and sorghum, little leaf in cotton, little leaf, this is important, and then mortal leaf for Frenching in citrus. So questions have been asked from deficiency symptoms, the particular names, and uh, the nutrients causing the deficiency symptoms. So movement of nutrients in soil in the roots. So you have mass flow, which will flow along with water, and diffusion is due to concentration gradient when there is movement of nutrients from higher concentration to lower concentration, which is governed by fixed law. And then root interception. So when the nutrients are very close to the root, it doesn't have to travel to the roots. It will, the root will just take it through its root hairs. And this was the first, the concept was first given by Barber. And theories and mechanism of nutrient uptake. What I want you to do with this is that you know the the theory and the scientists who gave them. So electrochemical theory is given by Lundigard. Then iron pump and ATPase is Menzel and Kirby. And then you have Carroll hypothesis by Epstein. Then there are also some elements which are beneficial for plants. So it's not beneficial for all plants, but beneficial for only some plants. Hence, they are not essence, they are not, they do not find part in the essential elements. So they are called beneficial. That is aluminium, iron, uh, sorry, aluminium, cobalt, sodium, selenium, and silicon. Silicon is found in high content in rice. It gives a robust nature of rice stem. So they are, then this uh, reduce the lodging of rice, uh, of high, high variety rice. Then you have uh, nitrogen. Nitrogen one uh, is one of the most deficient um, nutrient in India. Then you have uh, total nitrogen in soil, yeah, which ranges from 0 0.02 to 0 0.44. Indian soil content contains about 0 0.04 to 0 0.12 of nitrogen. You can see this is world average, but Indian soil is much lower in nitrogen. Uh, this is due to tropical nature of the soil. So it, our country is tropical and this is summer, it's very hot. So during this hot season, all the organic matters are being oxidized by the high temperature. And these tropical soils contain lower nitrogen and organic matter compared to humid soils. As I've said, Indian soils are universally deficient in nitrogen and which is due to low soil organic matter. And this is the extent of my, um, nitrogen deficiency then we have 63% uh, of our soil is low, and then medium is 26%, and high is only 11%, which means that nine more than around 90% of our soil requires nitrogen fertilization. And then these are the different forms of nitrogen. So you have total nitrogen, and then you have available nitrogen. Available nitrogen forms the part of the nitrogen which is taken up by taken up by the plants and you have organic and inorganic nitrogen organic nitrogen uh, contains hydrolyzable nitrogen and non-hydrolyzable nitrogen non-hydrolyzable nitrogen meaning it cannot be hydrolyzed to any available form they are fixed and they are insoluble human they are in the humus which is very stable and then hydrolyzable amino, amino sugar amino acid amino soluble human they can be avail made available as a result of mineralization. And then inorganic nitrogen are ammonium nitrogen, nitrate, and nitrite nitrogen. So those are the different forms of nitrogen in the soil. So uh, you can be asked which is the form which is non-hydrolyzable uh, nitrogen. 
So these are some of the questions. And fertilizer. So fertilizers are important for everyone to, uh, preparing for GRF, especially uh, those common fertilizers such as urea, then DAP, diamonium, phosphate, and the percentage of nutrients that they contain in them. So it can be asked for anybody. Then these are some sources of nitrogen. Then you can see here that even rainwater through acid rain, acid rain contains uh, sulfuric acid sometimes and then nitric acid. So this can be also a source of nitrogen for um, soil and for plants. Then you have organic menus, FYM, compost, oil cakes. They contain very low amount of nitrogen, but they supply the bulk of organic matter and hence are very important in nutrient management. So these are the common nitrogenous fertilizer and hydrous ammonia contains highest amount of nitrogen, but it is seldom used in India. But in America, uh, the highest nitrogenous fertilizer is anhydrous ammonia. They use a particular machine to inject it in the soil. And then you have urea which contain, which is the most common um, nitrogenous fertilizer in India. And now uh, the government of India have asked them to, due to non-agriculture, increasing non-agriculture use of subsidized urea, they have asked them to uh, coat with neem and they hence call neem coated and urea NCU. And it still contains the same amount of nitrogen, 46%. And DAP, contain, DAP is also common because it contains two important essential nutrients, nitrogen as well as phosphorus. And then you have pot potassium nitrate is not Potassium nitrate is not uh, commonly used. Ammonium nitrate is also not commonly used because it is highly explosive. It is used for making uh, explosive. And then, so they are using it in calcium. They mix it with calcium carbonate to make calcium ammonium nitrate and that will contain 25% of nitrogen. And biofertilizer is very important. Mm, it have been asked in one of the, uh, uh, plant science, I think. They have asked this uh, different types of um, bio for, um, different types of nitrogen fixing bacteria. So, so what are biofertilizers? They are substances which contain living microorganisms, which is used for improving soil fertility. And they are applied to seeds or plant surface or directly to soil. Then nitrogen fixing biofertilizers or nitrogen fixing bacteria. That, so nitrogen fixation, there are two types of biotic. A biotic is mostly uh, industrial and atmospheric. During thunder, there is a, so there is a lightning which react with uh, nitrogen in the atmosphere and they used to send nitrogen to the soil. So that is one. And there is another industrial uh, process of nitrogen fixation. So we're still here, yeah, the atmospheric nitrogen is uh, taken down to, uh, and through industrial process and they are converted into fertilizer nitrogen. And that is uh, the most common one is Haber-Bos process. Haber-Bos process. And then nitrogen fixation by biotic, uh, mostly two types, asymbiotic and symbiotic. A symbiotic is uh, where two or more organisms, they coexist. Symbiotic is they exist uh, by drawing nutrients or and by the other one giving shelter and the other one drawing nutrients. So you have two types in symbiotic, root nodules and the one which does not form root nodules. So azorhizobium do not, is a symbiotic nitrogen fixing bacteria, uh, azorhizobium, it has stem nodules and root nodules. So this classification is important and uh, you learn it and you will be ready for this. It can be asked for meds the following as well as for objective. And then this is the capacity, supplying capacity. Azola, azola is used in other, in lowland, wetland soils, especially with rice and then Bizier, Azotobacter and Azospirillum, they are mostly used in maize and sorghum. They can fix about 10 to nitrogen, 10 to 20 kg nitrogen per hectare. And this is a root nodule sowing uh, pink color. 
So pink color is due to lack hemoglobin. Lack hemoglobin, so you, uh, you keep in mind this. And then biological nitrogen fixation is the process of conversion of atmospheric nitrogen to ammonia by enzyme. The enzyme is called nitrogenase. And with the consumption of energy, energy is in the form of ATP. And this nitrogen, nitrogenase enzyme, and you have nitrogen uh, with eight electrons. It requires eight electrons for a molecule of nitrogen and 16 molecules of ATP to convert one molecule of ni atmospheric nitrogen. And one of the most important element which is used in this process is magnesium. And this is nitrogen transformation, nitrogen cycle in the atmosphere. Nitrogen cycle in the soil as well as in the atmosphere. So nitrogen transformation, sources of nitrogen are precipitation, I have said, when water can supply a little amount of nitrogen to the soil. And then fertilizers is a commercial source of nitrogen. And then atmospheric fixation, maybe in through biological nitrogen fixation. So they will con give this to well, organic nitrogen. Then ammonification. Organic nitrogen is in the form of amino acids or proteins. So through ammonification, they will form ammonia. And then nitrosomonas then they will convert to nitrate and nitrobacter. So nitrosomonas and nitrobacter are very important um, bacteria which are used in uh, nitrification process. Then you have nitrate at the end of uh, nitrification. So nitrate may be leached to groundwater, may be taken up by plants, or maybe they may be immobilized, or they may be dissimilatory, there may be dissimilatory nitrate reduction. So when this nitrate is converted to atmospheric nitrogen again, that is denitrification. And denitrification is uh, important in puddle soils or waterlogged soils or you say wetland soils. And this is all very important in global warming because this is a, this increase the temperature of the atmosphere. And then nitrification inhibitors. Nitrification inhibitors will inhibit, will slow down the nitrification process so that this will reduce the denitrification process. And so you learn some of this nitrification inhibitors in the commercial name of NSER, then dysine diamide, and neem cake is one of the naturally occurring nitrification inhibitors. And if, as I have said, uh, neem coated urea. So neem coated urea will reduce the nitrification process of urea. Then we have immobilization. What is immobilization? Immobilization is when nitrogen is made available to plants due to consumption by other microorganisms. So then the available nitrate in the soil. And then, then this will complete the cycle through organic form again. So immobilization and mineralization are two opposite process. From here, the most important thing that you should learn is the two organisms which are taking part in nitrification, nitrosomonas, as well as nitrobacter. And immobilization and mineralization, these are two important process in nitrogen transformation in soil. And then losses of N nitrogen from the soil. So you lose nitrogen from the soil during crop removal. Then during soil erosion, when the soil is eroded, you remove a portion of dissolved nitrogen and total nitrogen. Then during runoff, then leaching. And then some portion, some percentage of nitrogen is lost through this process, leaching, and then gaseous loss of uh, nitrogen as ammonia volatilization as well as denitrification. Uh, leaching, you can lose about 2 to 50% of your applied nitrogen through leaching. And then 90% and of leaching is in the form of nitrate. As I have told you in the one of the previous slides that uh, nitrate is a mobile nutrient, which means that it can move in the soil because they have negative charge. So it will leach down the soil and up to 90% of the fertilizer that you apply can be lost through uh, nitrate. And then it will also lose in the atmosphere through um, ammonia and through nitrogen gas. Ammonia loss will account for five to 35% of the 
loss of fertilizer nitrogen, uh, especially high when there is free ammonia in the soil. And then you have the nitrification. This is uh, bacteria are responsible for this in most cases. Then bacterial reduction of nitrate to nitrogen gas, especially under short supply of oxygen. An organism responsible, Thiobacillus, Pseudomonas, Micrococcus. And then this accounts for 10 to 40% of the losses of nitrogen in soil. As I've told that mineralization and immobilization are two opposite process. When does this take place and under what condition? So immobilization is inorganic nitrogen converting to organic. And mineralization is organic nitrogen converted to organic. And this takes place when there is a crit critical CN ratio, total carbon to total nitrogen ratio. When it is greater than 25 is to one, then there will be immobilization. And when it is less than 25 is to one, there'll be mineralization. So you learn the CN ratio of in these materials. Normal soil will is about 10 to 12, microbes eight to 10. So microbes and normal soil, they are almost similar. Then wheat straw have a high CN ratio. So when you add wheat straw in the soil, there will be immobilization. Legumes have 25 is to one. So there will be mineralization. So legumes, uh, they will increase the, they will not ha harmfully affect the growth of crops. And so does have very high um, CN ratio. So they will decompose very slowly. Then what are the environmental implications of nitrogen fertilization? So when nitrogen is applied, it will lose into the, I have told you that it will leach down in the soil so they can reach the groundwater. And then, we, then when this groundwater is uh, used as a drinking water, uh, that is harmful for health and consuming more than 10 milligrams of nitrogen per liter of water, that is 10 ppm of nitrogen. This causes blue baby syndrome or methemoglobinemia in babies. This is a very important environmental implications of nitrogen fertilization. And then you have eutrophication in water bodies. Uh, when there is a uh, plankton or green growth in, is very high, when plant growth is very high in lakes and water bodies, then it will increase the growth of those plants and the, there will be lack of oxygen for fishes. Though, so the fishes will die. And then escape of nitrogen and nitric oxide in the atmosphere during the nitrification. It damages the ozone layer as well as add to global warming. Then soil test for available nitrogen is there are many other soil tests, but the, the most important one and the most commonly used in, in India is mineralizable nitrogen of Subaya and Asiza method. So we are distilling the soil with alkaline uh, permanent, uh, potassium permanganate with a mix indicator and then collected with boric acid and titrated with um, 0.1 normal H2SO4, that is sulfuric acid. So fertility category is here. Um, we usually, after testing, we usually divide into uh, whether the soil falls into low, medium, or high category. Low category if it is less than 280 kg nitrogen per hectare, and medium category if it is uh, between 280 and 560, and then uh, high if it is more than 560 kilo gram nitrogen per hectare. And as I've said, uh, most of the Indian soil falls below uh, between low and medium category and only 11% is in high category. And the total N is through digestion with digestion mixture and acid. So you're digesting the soil with concentrated acid and then digestion mixture. So this uh, is related to nitrogen. And we have phosphorus. This is the second most important uh, essential nutrients found in the soil. And then pea content in Indian soil is 100 to 2000 ppm. This is quite high. The total pea content is so quite high, but available pea is low. So these are the fertility status uh, 
from different years, which have been given by uh, different scientists. So you, here also you will see that only 11% of the soil have high fertility status, which means that phosphorus is very important nutrient to improve crop yield. And this is the availability of um, phosphorus um, as a function of soil pH. You will see here that uh, range for highest phosphorus availability is in this pH range 6.7, between 6 and 7. And particularly at 6.7, there will be you know, highest phosphorus availability uh, because there is minimum fixation in this uh, pH range, in this pH. So you keep in mind this pH. 6 to 7 and 6.7. And then soil test for available P. In India, most commonly soil test for available P is Olsen method and Karch method. Olsen method is used for alkaline soil. Bray and Karch method is used for acid soil. In Northeast, most of our soil are acidic in nature, so we are using Bray and Karch method. And this is alkaline soil, like soils in Delhi and soils in you know, from the other parts of the country are alkaline. So we usually use this uh, sodium bicarbonate method. And then, yeah, the fertility status are different for Olsen as and Bray and lower for 10 kzp per hectare and then medium for 10 to 20 and then height for 20. And yeah, for Bray, 30 and then medium is 34 to 68. So you will see here that this is double. Uh, low, high is double of medium. So 10 into 2 is 20. Between these two is medium in nature. Phosphorus fertilizer, single superphosphate, uh, single superphosphate and triple superphosphate and diammonium phosphate. Diammonium phosphate is common because it supplies both ammonia, both ammonia, uh, ammonium ion that is uh, nitrogen and then phosphorus. And it contains 46% of P. And you can convert P to P205 by multiplying P with 9, 2.29. So if you multiply P with 2.29, then you will get P205. So time of P fertilizer application is basal. That is at the time of planting, you are applying the P fertilizer and method is band placement. The most common method for urea fertilizer application is uh, top dressing or br and broadcasting. You are broadcasting the fertilizer uh, after the growth of plants. Light nitrogen. There is also a symbiotic association of root and fungi in for uh, phosphorus. Then that is called uh, fungi with roots. That's called mycorrhiza. Myco as in fungi, fungi and rhiza rhiza with the roots, so mycorrhiza, fungi, and roots. That is a symbiotic association. There are two types, ecto mycorrhiza and endo. Ecto means outside. Here, the fungus uh, remains outside the root. It doesn't penetrate the root. So the fungus will form a mantle or a seed around the soil surface. And this is called hertig net. And mycelium devel develops intercellularly. It does not penetrate the cell. So example is bolitus and armenita. Endomycorrhiza, this is more important than ectomycorrhiza. Fungus will develop intracellularly. So they will penetrate the roots, they will um, penetrate the cell, and then they will be correct. This is characterized by formation of vesicles. They will formation vesicles like a uh, round structure and hence called vesicular or vascular mycorrhiza. They are glomus and endosian. Vesicles will store oil droplets and phosphorus. So this is a storage point of phosphorus. Why is it so beneficial? Because it acts like a root extension in three ways. This is a picture of mycorrhiza. So you can see the plant roots and you can see the mycorrhiza surrounding it. So this acts as an extension of the roots. It increases absorption of available nutrients. It increases the absorption of already available nutrients. Another one is it increases the availability of nutrients by solubilizing insoluble nutrients. It solubilizes the insoluble ones, make it soluble, and then increase the availability. Another one is that it increases the mobility. So it acts an extension of the roots in areas where the plant roots cannot reach, and the nutrient will travel through the high fee or the fungus, and then it will reach the roots. So this, uh, these are three ways in which 
mycorrhiza is beneficial for roots. Then we have potassium, which is the third uh, macronutrient, a macronutrient and a primary nutrient. Then fertility status. Fertility status of potassium in Indian soil is quite good because about 38% of our soil is high in fert uh, potassium status. And then these are the forms of uh, potassium in soil. You have solution K. The soil solution will contain 10 to 1 to 10 ppm of it. And then this is the forms of K which is available for uh, crop uptake. So you can supply this through fertilizer or you can supply this through rain. And this potassium is also susceptible to leaching. And then this can go to exchangeable uh, forms and exchangeable forms can come to solution forms. And then we have slowly available, which is non-exchangeable care, and then very slowly available, which is the mineral care. This comes 90 to 98% of the total care is in this form, which means that only a little portion of the total care is available for plant uptake. And then very important term in potassium nutrition is quantity inter intensity relationship. This is given by potassium. And care fixation is uh, highest in vermiculitic soil. And then these are potassium sites. We have two sites, P position, I position, and E position. P position is in the plane. Uh, planner position. These are easily exchangeable. These are easily available to uh, plants on the edges. This is E position. Uh, this is non-exchangeable, uh, but it can be exchangeable after uh, some time. And then I position. I position is stable, which is not exchangeable at all. And this is strongly held by the clay surface. Then we have sulfur. And sulfur is absorbed mainly by sulfate in the soil and a little quantity of sulfur dioxide from the atmosphere. S content is highest in cruciferi, brassica, uh, and then leguminous, uh, leguminous crop, and then gram. Gram will have, gram any family like rice will have uh, least amount of sulfur in its. Indian soil is, 40% uh, of Indian soil is deficient in sulfur. Here we can see extent of sulfur deficiency high only in 25% and the rest uh, 75% needs high sulfur application. Optimum nitrogen um, sulfur ratio in the soil is uh, 11 to 12 is to 1 in cereals. And as I've said, in legumes, it is higher, 15 to 16 is to 1. And then CS ratio in the soil is 140 is to 1. Some of the S-containing amino acids. S-containing amino acids is not only important in soil science, else, but important in all the subjects. This can be uh, one of the uh, questions which can be asked. Cysteine, cysteine, and methionine. These are sulfur-containing amino acids. So like uh, nitrogen and phosphorus, so there is mineralization and immobilization for sulfur also. So this is governed by uh, C is to S ratio, total sulfur to total total carbon to total sulfur ratio. So 200 is to one. And then if it is less than that, there'll be mineralization. And 400 is to one, then immobilization. Between this, there'll be an equilibrium, meaning there will be not much change. And then soil test for available sulfur. Then uh, we have two most common soil tests, which is 0.15% calcium chloride then deficient if it is less than 10 ppm and 500 ppm p solution from prepared from monocalcium phosphate and p con sorry this is should be as s content s content is estimated using a turbidity meter or nephilometer so this is the instrument used for estimating sulfur in, uh, in a sample then calcium and magnesium Calcium and magnesium deficiency is not so much found in the soil, but only in very acidic soils like so acid soils of Northeast India. And deficient when exchangeable calcium is two milli equivalent per 100 gram soil. So, and magnesium is less than 0.5 milli equivalent per 100 gram soil. Magnesium deficiencies can occur 
in soils with high calcium is to magnesium ratio. So calcium and magnesium, calcium is higher in quantity, higher in quantity. And when the cell calcium is higher, then there will be not much of magnesium deficiency. But when calcium, magnesium is, calcium and magnesium ratio is more than 10 to 15 is to one, then you will observe magnesium deficiency in plants. As of the chlorophyll accounts, 15 to 20% total magnesium in the plants. And in most soil exchangeable, magnesium is 4 to 20% of the cation exchange capacity. Aluminum saturation of 65 to 70% is often associated with magnesium deficiency. There is always a competition for ammonium ion and magnesium ion, and that can reduce magnesium uptake. And this is responsible for grass titani disease in cattle where the forage contains less magnesium. Then micronutrients. Micronutrients are those nutrients which are required only in small quantity. So these are the critical limit and this is the extent of deficiency. So you can see in 2000, from the study between 2011 to 2017, Jing is 30 deficient. This is the most deficient micronutrients in, plant, in Indian soils, where 36.5% of the soil is deficient in Jing, then iron 12.8, then copper 4.2, and then manganese 7.1. Then these are the method of estimation. So Jing, copper, iron, and manganese can be estimated through DTPS solution. And then boron is, use, uh, is using hot water and then molybdenum use ammonium oxalate at pH 2.3. So uh, we have a soil fertility evaluation. So we have already studied the different nutrients and the method in which they are estimated in plants and soils. So we have uh, we need to evaluate the soil fertility. There are different methods. One is microbial method, and the next is vegetative method, and another is chemical method. Microbial method, is we are using microorganism, Isotobacter, Aspergillus, and then uh, Cunningham lab plate test. This is mainly for phosphorus. And vegetative methods, we are using invisible symptoms, uh, the deficiency symptoms that are shown when the plant is deficient of that particular nutrient. Here we can see purple discoloration, which is a, uh, a sign of phosphorus deficiency in maize. And this Maize is used as a phosphorus uh, deficiency indicator plant. And then chemical method. This is easy and quick. And we, this can be done by plant analysis or soil analysis. So DRIS um, diagnosis and recommendation integrated system, which is first uh, proposed by Bayfields. You just know the name. And crop logging is uh, first used in sugarcane in Hawaii. And then critical limit, so critical limit is the limit below which plant soil deficiency symptom. This was first uh, used by Kate and Nelson. And then soil analysis, a uh, very important method uses soil uh, nutrient index value, which is first given by Parkel. And then first used in India by Ramamurti and Bajaj in Indian soils. So when the value is uh, less than 1.67, it is low between 1.67 and 2.33 medium and high 2.33 uh, above 2. Point, this value is high. So soil fertility ratings like if I have shown in the previous slide in case of nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium, soil fertility ratings, we are rating whether the nutrient is low, medium or high. So this was us in one of the um, exams that we have given. When was soil test testing laboratories established in India? So 1955-56. And if it is given only one year, it should be 1955. So irrigation water quality. So we have three um, very important measures of irrigation water quality. We have salinity hazard. We have sodium. Salinity is due to soil present. Uh, and then sodium hazard due to sodium in the soil, and then alkalinity hazard due to carbonates. So these are the different classes. So residual sodium carbonate of less than 1.25 is 
and it can be safely used for this was asked in one of the exams that we have given in general agriculture not in soil but in agriculture so i feel this irrigation water quality is important for everyone to know um, so the class and the, the ec electrical conductivity sodium absorption ratio these are the um, formula which i have given so you learn this uh, this will be made available for you and then alkalinity hazard whether the soil is alkaline or not so these are the values are given and whether it can be used safely or not are also given and then soil organic matter soil organic matter is very important and hum there are two types there are two um, term which is important humus and soil organic matter humus is stable and they are a complex resistant mixture it is stable and resistant it's a mixture of brown to or dark brown amorphous and colloidal organic substance that result from microbial decomposition uh, or they can be synthesized and then have the chemical and physical properties of great significance to soil and plants they control the many reactions that are going on in the plant system and then soil organic matters refers to non humic substance so total organic matter is there and it constitute this soil organic matter constitute 10 to 15% this is important for soil science students and humus you have and then you can be asked whether uh, humin is the insoluble or soluble portion of humus and then you have this is the various fractionation method and then when the soluble portion is treated with acid whether it precipitate or it's not precipitated so you have humic acid fulvic acid and hematomelanic acid this is the alcohol soluble portion of the humic acid so this uh, chart is important for soil science students and then soil organic carbon estimation it is very important uh, because soil organic matter is the seed of nitrogen in soil and then they commonly as estimated by Wobbly and Black method using potassium dichromate. Uh, I'm sure you have done this in your practical uh, classes. Soil organic matter is assumed to contain 58% carbon. So if you know how much of soil organic matter is there, you multiply this organic carbon content with a factor 1.724. And this 1.724 is called Bamblin factor, Van Bamblin factor. Soil acidity. So, uh, soil acidity is one of the most important constraints in the country, and especially in the Northeast. If you have tested your uh, Pasigat soil, I'm sure that it will be somewhere uh, between four to six pH. So, that have a very um, that is a very important constraint for increasing agriculture production. So, degree of soil acidity or alkalinity expressed as pH is a uh, is called soil acidity and then pH is a master variable because uh, it contains most of the reaction in soil, the behavior of nutrient in soil and plant growth in soil, what, what type of plant you are going to grow and what type of nutrients are available. It affects all the reactions in soil. Uh, it is ne the negative log of hydrogen ion concentration. And the first original concept of pH was given by Sorensen. And pH range, range of pH is 0 to 14. So 0 to 14. Uh, 0 if the concentration is more than 10 to the power 14. So pH of pure water is supposed to be 7. And the ionic product, see, you know, uh, you learn this ionic product of water. This is 10 to the power uh, minus 14 mole square per decimeter square, uh, six times square. So the soil have a property called buffering, or any any solution have a buffering capacity. Soil also have a buffering capacity, uh, which is the tolerance to change its pH or the tolerance to change its acidity. It is highest in the pH range between 4.5 and 6. Between this, you know, the, it's very difficult to change the pH of the soil. Uh, so this is, uh, these are some of the acidity or the soil pH of uh, soil materials. You can see pure water and milk is at 7. And some of the sources of acidity, 
um, carbonic and other organic acids, like uh, organic matter and nitrogen during nitrification, and then sulfur during oxidation of sulfur when you are applying uh, sulfur containing fertilizers and acid pre precipitation, pH of acid rain is 5.6. So acid rains contain nitric acid. So when it rains down, it can change the pH to some extent. Uh, plant ion uptake cations, when it takes a positive charge, like uh, calcium and magnesium, Details. This is for soil science students. You have active acidity, exchangeable acidity, residual acidity, and then total acidity. So when you are applying lime, liming materials to increase the pH, you are dealing only with active acidity. Active acidity forms only a little portion of the total acidity in soil. And distribution of acid soils in India, this is very important. And the classification of uh, acid soil. We have strongly acidic soils, moderately acidic soils, and slightly acidic soils and the pH range and the area covered. So these are the um, area. So strongly acidic soils have uh, 6.2 million hectare in India. This is uh, and then you have uh, 24.41 and then 62.18. So this slightly acidic soil. So strongly acidic soil is a main constraint for agriculture. Then I have given two formulas here, which are very important, person acid saturation and person base saturation. So person acid saturation is hydrogen and aluminum by uh, cation exchange capacity. And base, person base saturation, calcium, magnesium. So these are the base, uh, new basic, uh, cation in soil, and then you will divide by the cation exchange capacity. How do you manage the acid soil? By applying agricultural lime. What are agricultural lime? They are mainly carbonates, oxides, hydroxides, calcium, and magnesium. And this can raise the pH of soil. And so this are, uh, we have calcium carbonate, uh, carbonate equivalent. We have cal calcium carbonate. And then equivalent to this, we are giving uh, calcium carbonate equivalent, we are calculating this. And then, so calcium carbonate is here, which means that calcium oxide is having more uh, liming effect than calcium carbonate. And dolomite, which is calcium magnesium carbonate, is a little bit more effective than calcium carbonate. So important thing is to learn the calcium carbonate equivalent of this uh, liming materials. Soil, salt affected soils, um, salinity is due to chlorides and sulfates of calcium, magnesium, and sodium. And these salts are developed from weathering, groundwater, irrigation water. As I have said, that irrigation water quality is important. And then sea, they are from sea water intrusion into the land. So salinity, uh, questions where have been asked from this for general questions. So we have a changeable sodium percentage, and then we have sodium absorption ratio. Uh, important thing is to learn the formula. Exchangeable sodium percentage, as the name suggests, we are dividing the exchangeable sodium by total uh, cation exchange capacity. So as the name suggests, there should be percentage, and hence we are multiplying by 100. And sodium absorption ratio, it's a ratio sodium as a numerator and calcium magnesium divided by two whole square as a denominator. So this measures the sodium hazard of the soil, so exchangeable sodium percentage and sodium absorption ratio. This is important for all subjects. And classification of salt affected soils. And then we have here, uh, most, the most important is pH, EC, and sodium absorption ratio. These have been always asked uh, for plant pathology, for physical science, for vertical cell science. So you know that there are two, three types of soil affected soils, saline soils, saline sodic soils, and sodic soils. Sodic soils will have high uh, sodium absorption ratio compared to the other two. 
So this is uh, the classification. Uh, important thing is to learn this uh, table. Um, pH saline soil will have uh, less than 8.5 and saline sodic soil and sodic soil will have high uh, pH. And electrical conductivity is a measure of salinity. So uh, saline soils will have high salinity that is more than four and saline sodic soil also will have more than four and sodic soil will have very less salinity, less salinity compared to this saline and saline sodic soil. And sodium absorption ratio, uh, sodium absorption ratio, sodium will be high in sodic and saline sodic soil. So we have more than 15, more than 15. Or in some cases, they will be, you will be given a value of more than 13. And this is less in saline sodic soils. Then the structure, these are saline and saline sodic soils are flocculated. This will have a poor structure. Saline and sodic soil will have a poor structure. Hence, the soil will be deflocculated. So infiltration and drainage are poor in sodic soil. And then nomenclature, we are using solon chalk, solon chalk for uh, saline and solonets, solonets for sodic soils. And they are also called uh, black alkali because it will uh, oxidize the organic matter and hence the organic, there will be black formation on the surface. And why alkali? Because they, this will not oxidize the um, organic matter in the soil. And then these are the distribution of uh, soil affected soils in India. You don't have to learn all the states, but you know the total uh, area in India. So sodic soil is uh, have a, a 3.78 million hectare. So 3 million hectare. And then saline have 2.3, which is almost 3 million hectare. And total is 6.7 million hectare. So um, sometimes you will see value 7 million hectare. So you have to tick which have a value closest to this value, 6.75. And then how do you reclaim this uh, saline, uh, soil affected soils? Physical, you have to do it plow subsoiling, then sanding profile in bison is that you have to invert the soil profile using uh, a tractor and then scrapping is that we have to remove the soil affected portion and then you have to uh, deposit it somewhere else. Hydrotechnical is using water. You have to drain the soil with a good quality water. And then chemicals is using uh, calcium to replace sodium in the complex. And we have uh, uh, chemical amendments like gypsum, then calcium chloride, sulfuric acid, iron sulfate. These are some of the chemical amendments used for correcting, reclaiming, reclaiming, reclaiming soil, soil affected soils. And then soil erosion. Soil erosion is important. Uh, this is the table, the land degradation status in India. We can see that almost half of our land area is affected. Total area of in India is 329 million hectare, and we have 187 million hectare affected by di different types of land degradation process. So land degradation and soil erosion are sometimes used interchangeably, but they are different. And land degradation, it means the reduction in the capacity of land to pro provide ecosystem services and goods. And then soil erosion is a three-step process you are removing the soil that is uh, detaching the soil particles and then they are being transported by different agents, maybe by water or by wind or by ice or by glaciers and they are deposited somewhere else. And there are two types of erosion. One is geological erosion and the other is accelerated erosion. Geological erosion is a natural process. It is rate is low and then the loss of soil is compensated by for soil formation. So soil loss and soil formation are in equilibrium and hence do not uh, affect the uh, property of the soil. And then we have accelerated erosion. Human are responsible for this. This is also called human induced soil erosion and it exceeds the normal rate of soil formation and hence there are the losses of soil. And type of degradation, we have water erosion, wind erosion, chemical erosion is due to soil acidity or saline, saline soil formation. Then the total area is 187.8. This can be asked in one of the questions. 
then water erosion. So in water erosion, the agent responsible is water, removal of soil water, maybe runoff water, ice, glaciers, snow, and types are there, splash erosion, falling raindrop will have to force 14 times of its weight, and then seed erosion, removal of uniform thin surface as in the form of sheet, and we have real erosion, removal of water in small channels. When this real erosion, the real is more than 30 centimeters depth, this is called, there will be gully formation, and this is called gully erosion. And then you have uh, soil loss equation. This is universal soil loss equation. So it's very simple. A equal to equals R K L S C P. So soil loss A, these are the factors of uh, soil loss. So R is the rainfall, and then K is erodibility factor. So you compare with this soil loss equation of wind erosion, then it's quite similar, but there's some differences. L is the slope length, S is the slope, slope steepness. So if the slope, slope is steep, the steepness is there, the water erosion will be higher. Then C is the soil cover management factor. Bare, barren soil will have high water erosion compared to soil cover with vegetation. And then a P is the supporting practices or uh, um, soil water conservation practices that you are uh, that are taken up. And then soil tolerance limit. This is the threshold upper limit of soil erosion that can be allowed without degrading the long-term productivity of specific soil. In India, our default value is 11.2 megagram. Megagram is ton. 11.2 tons per hectare per year. So when the soil erosion is below this value, there are, we are saying that it's not degrading the soil, but above this, it will limit the function of the soil and the productivity of the soil. Then we have wind erosion. Then wind is the factor uh, or the agent responsible for dislodging the soil particles. And it is moved by three phenomena. We have saltation, then suspension, and then surface creep. So uh, saltation is soil moved by a series of salt bounces. These are common in sand dunes in desert, and in sandy soils, and bounce and consist of fine particles ranging from, you know, the range of this soil, 0.1 to 0.5 millimeter. And accounts uh, more more than 50%, that is 50 to 75% of soil erosion by wind. And then we have suspension. Suspension, yeah, small, very small particles are uh, suspended in the air and they are moved by the wind. It will float in the air and this accounts for 40% of the wind erosion. And then we have surface creep, soil particles larger than 0.5 millimeter but are smaller than three millimeter. They are too heavy. So they will just roll and slide along the surface. And this accounts for five to 25% of the soil erosion. Then how do we estimate wind erosion, which is similar to universal soil loss equation. And soil loss through wind erosion is a function of I scale CLV. So I is erodibility index, C is climatic factor, K is surface roughness, L is the length of salt unsaltered belt, and V is vegetative barriers. So universal soil loss equation as well as this wind loss equation have a K, but it is different, uh, that have different meaning. In wind loss equation, K is surface roughness, but in universal soil loss equation, K is erodibility factor. These are two, one important point to be kept in mind. Then water set management. This is important for forestry uh, as well as agriculture students. Uh, then what important here is that you have to know the size of this water set. So we have water set which is 50 to 2 lakh hectare. Um, we have sub milli micro mini. So that is a way to remember sub milli micro mini. Sub is 50 to 10 to 50,000 hectare. 
then 1,000 to 10,000 hectare, then 100 to 1,000 hectare, and then to 100 hectare. So you know the size of this water set. And what are these water set? They, there is a topography. Here you can see in the in my picture, the topography is there. And then hydrological unit, because the water is draining off at a common point and by a network of channels. There are many channels and the water is draining off in this uh, common point. And topography, uh, they have a similar topography. So uh, that will be, there are many other slides, but that will be for my lecture. Uh, if time permits, then we can take some more, but uh, I'll be more interested in the discussion part. Hello, sir. Yeah, if there is any questions that you want to ask, uh, we can have a discussion. Yeah, have you finished it? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, we can discuss. Uh, if students have a particular area of interest, then, then we can discuss okay. that area. Okay, yeah, all right. So, uh, dear students, if you have any query, you just ask it directly. Uh, yeah. Uh, can you look into chat box? Uh, there was a query. The chat box, uh, it is written that yeah. uh, miss in hilly area is uh, deficiency in which nutrient? In fact, uh, more is uh, very high nutrient content because they have very high uh, organic matter. But the problem which we have here is very high erosion. So phosphorus uh, fixation due to very highly acidic soils so phosphorus deficiency is one um, important nutrient which is uh, deficient in northeast soil. As I have uh, shown in the one of the previous slide that the pH is affecting the phosphorus availability. So pH between six to seven have uh, between that pH phosphorus availability is high, but as uh, northeast soil have pH between four, four, five, six below six. So phosphorus is one of the main nutrient which is deficient. And next also will come potassium. Pink. What about the zinc actually? Zinc also it is uh, depleting, no? Yes, sir, yes, sir. In acid soil, there was yes. a problem. That's what in... Uh, Fruits and it's a citrus yes. uh, fruit. And, and zinc is also deficient in rice, lowland rice system. So lowland rice, we are having, uh, we are water is standing there. So in this case, zinc deficiency is also very high, especially in the nurseries. Uh, between uh, after around three four weeks, we can see zinc deficiency. Okay. Any other question? Okay, if no other question, then uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Emmanuel, for uh, giving you our valuable time to uh, coach our students in the soil science discipline. Thank you so much. Thank you, student, for joining us. And uh, we will, I think I have uh, uploaded that uh, um, link also. Please use it. Okay, sir, thank you sir, so much. Uh, just, yes, sir, sir, just a few points. Uh, yeah. my Humble request to students is talk to your seniors, talk to anyone the, who is uh, 
um, experience right to us because uh, Rasa sir have uh, all of our numbers and give us uh, a particular chapter which you want us to um, give it to you. So we will be ready to contact you anytime, maybe through Zoom or uh, through any mode. I have talked to uh, some of the students and they are very eager to learn. But you talk to your seniors for notes, for anything, for any kind of guidance, because uh, seniors are very ready to help. If you are not talking, uh, we cannot come and help. But if you talk on and if you ask us only, then we will be also ready to help. So please seek uh, advice and help from others. Do not hesitate to talk to others. That is my humble advice from, um, that's from my side. Sir. Thank you so much. Uh, before leaving, can you make me as a host? Actually, by mistake, uh, default, uh, you become a host due to some network issue. Can you make me host? I will enter the sure, meeting. Sir, sir. You are the co-host now, sir. Uh, no, no, no. Make me a uh, host. Make me host. Yeah. Yeah. 